Hey guys, how's everyone doing? This is Sir Jedi Sentinel, and welcome back to Sentinel Reviews. With Doctor Who Series 14 slash Season 1 now concluded, there is nothing left to do but do the episode ranking. You know, when I, during the Whitaker era, I did this for Series 11 and 12, I looked at the episodes and ranked them from worst to best. Nothing more to say on that, you know how these rankings work. Before we get into that video, before we get into that in and of itself, I will start with my review on the season overall. It was fine. It's not one of the worst seasons the show has ever had, especially the revival era, but it's not one of the best. Um, I, as you saw in my reviews, I had a lot of issues with this season. And I was really nervous going in because, as you probably know, if you're a longtime subscriber, I'm not the biggest fan of Russell T. Davies' work on Doctor Who. And honestly, at the end of this season, I just feel vindicated in that opinion. That's just me. You're free to disagree. But yeah, I just wasn't a fan. I will say, even though his era, his new era, RTD2, is still going on. So we have yet to see where he's going to go from here with the next season and however long he's going to stay. But I do think this season is genuinely an improve. At least this season is genuinely an improvement over his first era. If you're not a longtime viewer of my videos, then um, let me give you my controversial take. The Tenth Doctor era, in my opinion, is the single worst era, not only of New Who, but of the entire series. I despise that era, and David Tennant as the Tenth Doctor is my least favorite Doctor. Also, Rose Tyler is my least favorite companion, but that's a little different. So, you know, hearing the news that Russell T. Davies was going to be the next showrunner, I was very worried. Like I said, he's shown clear signs of improvement from that first era. A lot of the mistakes he's made that really soured me on his first era, he's not making here. He, there are clear signs of improvement. A lot of the mistakes he's made, not all of them. Some of them he is still making, especially his finale. But also, you know, he is kind of making new ones. I, I won't give any much more thought than that. This is an overview, like I said. But overall, this is a downgrade from the Chibnall era. I mean, the Chibnall era is the best era New Who has ever had. So it was always going to be a downgrade. It was only a question of how much of a downgrade it was going to be. But anyway, now season ranking. There are eight episodes to talk about. The The finale being two episodes, I will be counting them as one, but I will be going by the Disney Plus episode order. Um, international viewers, well, no, not international viewers, British viewers, how is it set up on iPlayer? I'd really like to know because on Disney Plus, if you search Doctor Who, it'll pull up all its options, as you can see here, we have the series, the three 60th anniversary specials, and then the fourth special, the 2023 Christmas special, The Church on Ruby Road. But then if you go into the series and go to series 14, season one, you'll see that The Church of Ruby Road is also listed as the first episode of the season. Like I said, I'm going by the Disney Plus episode order, which means I will be counting The Church on Ruby Road. And like I said, for... British viewers who watch my content. Is it the same way on iPlayer? I'm just really curious about that and would like to know. But anyway, everything shared is my opinion. There is nothing objective about this because there is no such thing as objectivity in art. So if you disagree, feel free to. And without further ado, let's get started. So starting at the bottom of the list and working our way up. Number eight, the worst episode of the season. The Church on Ruby Road. This is an episode, the more I think about it, I think the promotion failed this episode in particular. Because when it was announced Chris Chibnall was stepping down and that Russell T. Davies was going to take over as showrunner again, the promotional material and the press tours and stuff, I've talked about this before, really lean into this idea of Russell T. Davies is doing new stuff with Doctor Who. Like, I believe... He was quoted as saying, I would only ever come back to Doctor Who if I could do new things with it. And all throughout it, leading up to the 60th anniversary, he kept saying, he basically kept pushing new, new, new. 
So the church on Ruby Road, one of its big issues is in terms of tone, style, and execution, how derivative it is of Russell's first era. And that's where I come in with saying, I think the promotion failed this episode more than anything else. Because if you were hyped up as a fan of Russell T. Davies and, you know, him talking about all the new stuff he was going to do, or if you didn't like Russell's first era and were somewhat cautious of him becoming back, but intrigued by the new stuff he was doing, this episode you know, in that regard, really kind kind of sours you on his whole era going forward. Shooty Gatwa and Millie Gibson have great chemistry, and they are consistently the best part of the episode. They have a really good dynamic that's really strongly established, very well off. They have very clear-cut characters that are also strongly introduced. The goblins are slightly underwhelming villains. The effects on them are good, save for the obviously animatronic Goblin King. But more than anything else, and I have talked about this in the past, my big issue, the thing that really sours this episode for me, is just Russell T. Davies playing into problematic tropes. It's not a long scene, it doesn't have lasting consequences on the episode or the era as a whole, but just the way the third act starts continues even now, half a year later, to bug me. For context, if you don't remember, after the the Doctor and Ruby stop the goblins from eating the baby Carla is currently fostering, the goblins go back in time to eat Ruby as a baby, and we briefly see a timeline where Carla never raised Ruby. In the timeline where Carla raised Ruby, she's this bright, bubbly, energetic, very caring, very lovely woman. She even makes it a note that she has fostered over 30 kids. In the timeline where Carla never raised Ruby, she is constantly spent, has no energy, she's continually exhausted, she hates fostering, she's only fostered five or six kids, and she only does it for the money. Russell T. Davies is playing with some really problematic tropes about foster parents and he's not making any kind of commentary or comment on it he's just doing it and given one of the themes of this season overall like ruby being an orphan looking for where she came from and you know the doctor continuing the storyline of the timeless child but from this point of view that he is an orphan russell is very weirdly anti-found family this season like he 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 will constantly he will especially in one more episode do one more thing that kind of paints Carla as a terrible person without Ruby in her life but like the emphasis on Ruby finding her parents which I can understand but also really downplaying the role Carla had in Ruby's life like I said just this particular scene is so problematic that it, that it really takes me out of the episode in the worst possible way. Number seven, our finale, The Legend of Ruby Sunday, Empire of Death. This set of episodes, this two-parter, is just an incoherent mess. Like, it's so nonsensical, too. Like, The Legend of Ruby Sunday, Russell is obviously juggling all his mystery box and plot points to build up to the reveal it's all set up for part two, which will be the payoff. Now, we as the audience know, or have been led to believe, that several of the plot points in some ways have been linked. Susan Twist, Ruby's, pa Ruby's parentage, the one who waits. The problem is the legend of Ruby Sunday doesn't seem to think they are, and thus the episode lacks cohesion, because rather than working together, the various plot points are competing for screen time. But that's okay, because when you get to Empire of Death, it very quickly makes it clear that, aside from the reveal in the final minutes of the, of the episode, the rest of the Legend of Ruby Sunday does not matter. And then, Empire of Death makes it clear that the majority of its episode isn't gonna matter. Like I said, this is the thing that took me out of the episode. In the first minute... You know, not counting the recap and the opening titles, Sutek kills the entire unit cast and Rose Noble. Basically, the closest thing this season has to leads 
outside of the Doctor and Ruby. In that one moment, Russell T. Davies has so blatantly set up without any buildup or anything that he's doing a reset button. So as the episode plays out, there's this sense of, you've already revealed you're going to undo all of this, why should I care? Not just that, it's also very clear that Russell is playing this episode by the rule of cool. You know, if it looks or sounds cool, that's what's going to happen. And because a lot of the things that are set up or revealed or talked about in this episode, if you think about them even for a second, they don't make any sense. Like, I'm not going to do a full list of things, but, for example, in Harriet's monologue in introducing Sutek in The Legend of Ruby Sunday, she lists the Mara as the god of beasts. It's very clear that, you know, if you've watched Kinda and Snake Dance, the god of beasts makes no sense as a moniker, except just for the idea that the Mara is a giant snake. Like, based on how the Mara works in those stories. I personally call the Mara the God of Fear, but that's getting beside the point. There are other instances of this as well. For example, the reveal that Ruby's mother is just a person. It's kind of a weird double-edged sword because one, I'm thankful for that. Like, I talked about this in my reviews throughout the season. I was worried that it was building up that Ruby is a member of the Pantheon. She's not. It's just, it's Sutek didn't know who Ruby's mother was, and he just wanted this mystery answered before he killed her. But if Ruby's mother isn't someone important, which again is a good thing, why does Sutek care? Also, the fact that Sutek was able to reach across space and time and possess Mel, seemingly, you know, having to look for her and find her with no sort of trail... How could he not figure that out? From start to beginning, this two-parter is just absolutely frustrating. It's one of Russell's weakest finales. It's not as bad as The End of Time or Last of the Time Lords, because this time, Russell actually manages to not commit flagrant character assassination on the Doctor. But it's one of his most nonsensical, and... I would say, too, that the various arcs we get, I don't know what the fandom is ultimately going to name them, but, like, the one who waits, Ruby's parentage, and Susan Triad, it's clear that Russell is just floating ideas because they they don't all work together entirely. I would say that whatever this arc is ultimately going to be, it has supplanted Bad Wolf as his worst series arc. Number six. Babies. Sorry, space babies. Didn't find that funny? Don't worry, Shooty Gothwell will repeat that joke every two to three minutes until the end of the episode. Like the church on Ruby Road, this has the same problem. It's just, it's so derivative of Russell's first era. Just thankfully, unlike the church on Ruby Road, it doesn't have the problematic elements of it. (laughs) But yeah, this this episode is very fast-paced. It's... Um, Like, it's going through so many beats of a companion introduction episode, but it's trying to do them as fast as possible. Like, you know, in the opening scene where the Doctor takes Ruby to the past, and we have that lame joke about the butterfly effect, which also leads to something that really annoyed me that I'm not going to talk about here, otherwise we'd be here all day. But then, he's going through everything as fast as possible, like... You know, the complete rundown of who he is, what he does, how time travel works, all of that, before, you know, the adventure of Space Babies begins properly. It's this breakneck pace, um, and it feels like, let's get you up to speed as fast as possible. The problem is, I think Space Babies is kind of a terrible first episode, even though it is played like an introductory episode. And, like, I don't think as the first episode of the season, it works despite that. I do think for all its problems, and I do think this is why Disney Plus did it this way, The Church on Ruby Road is supposed to be the first episode of the season. And I will say, again, for all my problems of that, and seeing it as the weakest episode of the season, it is a better introduction than Space Babies. There are other things about this, like this episode just seems like a rehash of End of the World. Like, 
in fact, they replayed the phone scene from End of the World verbatim, where the Doctor modifies Rose's phone in End of the World so that she can call her friends and family from anywhere in time and space. We get that scene repeated verbatim here in Space Babies. The CG on the babies isn't great. Like, this episode was mostly looking good until they started doing that with the babies. Um, beyond that, though, the humor in this episode is really juvenile. Like I said, like I opened with, there is that really annoying running joke where the Doctor constantly corrects himself. Babies. Sorry, space babies. And it, it gets tiresome fast. But also, like, there's just a lot of juvenile humor that I found childish and unfunny. You know, like, from the deus ex fart joke... To the monster, the boogeyman literally made out of boogers, using the American vernacular. It, it probably plays out better in the British vernacular. To just this, these two weird moments in the stories where Russell starts to make some kind of commentary. But it has no bearing on the episode whatsoever. Like, he's making a commentary on reproductive rights and freedom. And then the status of refugees. But then none of the rest of the episode plays into that. It's just, this is an episode that is going too fast and has no breathing room. Number five. Boom. Hopefully this segment will be much shorter than my rants on the previous episodes because I don't really have a lot to say about Boom. It's a fine episode. Some of my friends and other fans of the show have said that the Moffatisms really took them out of this story. They didn't bug me, but that wasn't my big issue with the story. Like I said in that review, my issue is just that Moffat is making so many commentaries all at once. Just from, you know, capitalism in war. Like, he is specifically going after war profiteering. But then he is going after things like for-profit healthcare, religion in war. He is making so many commentaries in this episode... That they all kind of get muddled and, it and they become a little messy and unclear on what he's saying. The other issue I had, which is a little more forgivable, is the child character in this episode. Like, when you listen, look at the script and listen to what she's saying, it's very clearly obvious that this role was written younger than the actor cast. And I say this is forgivable because this was probably a constraint of the filming schedule and stuff. Like... When you work with child actors, the younger you get, the restrictions and the rules of working with them get more stringent. So it was probably something that the production just couldn't accommodate. But that being said, like the one thing that really bugs me about this episode about that particular character is the ending, you know, like the doctor apologizes to the child for her father being gone and she says he's not gone he's just dead he's not gone and it's very clear it's not a child thing it's a viewpoint thing and had that been introduced much earlier in the episode it would have made it a little more bearable but it's a but boom does have a really strong premise it's one of shooty's strongest performances because it allows him to slow down which is something at that by that point we hadn't really seen with this doctor. He was always running and he always had this energy to him. So giving him a moment to slow down really helped. We got a good performance from Verata Sethu, and this does make me excited to see her next season as a companion, even if it's not going to be this character. Number four, Rogue. So if I'm being honest, when I initially came up with this list, with this ranking, Rogue and Boom were actually tied. I kept going back and forth on which one I liked more. Ultimately, I decided if I was just going to rewatch an episode just for entertainment value, which one would I be more likely to revisit? Rogue One. Rogue is just a very fun episode, mainly due to Jonathan Groff. Like I said in that review, and I'll stick by that, initially his chemistry with Shudi Gatwa isn't great it but as the episode goes on it gets better it improves it's just they, they are off to a really rough start and this episode if i'm being honest doesn't really give them enough time one 45 minute episode 
just isn't enough time to develop a relationship like this episode wants to do. But in the grand scheme of things, because of how fast-paced this season was, at only 8 episodes, due to the changing nature of TV due to streaming, this episode really is our breather, and it's just nice to sit back, relax, and have fun. I can think of no better way to conclude this segment than to surmise how I opened my review of Rogue. Rogue is a filler episode. Filler episodes are not a dirty word, no matter what the internet will have you believe. But Rogue is a filler episode, and this season, at up to this point, desperately needed a filler episode. Number 3. Dot and Bubble In hindsight, I kind of view this episode as the antithesis to The Legend of Ruby Sunday, Empire of Death. Because whereas the Sutek reveal kind of plays out that the in The Legend of Ruby Sunday kind of plays out that the rest of the episode is inconsequential, the twist reveal of Dot and Bubble, that the Doctor's been trying to help a planet of white supremacists, is only enhanced by everything leading up to it. You know, just for the sake of the twist, The Legend of Ruby Sunday and Empire of Death discards everything that came before it. But you need everything in Dot and Bubble for the twist to land. This is a brutal episode. And I love it for that. I said it in my review of Dot and Bubble. I love when sci-fi in its messaging is absolutely blunt. And like this, I think, further down the line, will be evaluated among some of Doctor Who's best episodes, like Oxygen or The Happiness Patrol or Doctor Who and the Silurians. Like this, honestly, in a lot of ways, feels like a Pertwee era episode. In really in just how blunt its messaging is. I have nothing more to say. Brilliant visual execution, not just with the dot and the bubble, but with the pastel color scheme. I think that the visual brightness creates a really good contrast with what's being set up. Um, our lead actress, whose name I am forgetting at this moment, I apologize, is really good at downplaying... Um, what's going on until you get the reveal and then everything is recontextualized. Shudi gives one of his best performances in this episode. I know I said that I said that a couple times so far, but it is true here just the devastation that these people do not want him saving them. It's it's just brilliant all around. Number 2, 73 yards. Like Boom and Rogue, Dot and Bubble and 73 Yards were kind of tied. And I think if I made this list at another point in time, my my point of view might my opinion might have shifted and I might say, oh, I actually prefer Dot and Bubble more. It's a really tough call. These are both very heavy episodes in very different ways. I just I like 73 Yards more just because it's going for ambiguity. And I appreciate that it sticks to its guns in being ambiguous, you know? I think of the last couple of times Doctor Who tried to go for something ambiguous and just kind of fell on its face. Be it Listen, which sort of chickens out at the last second and gives a definitive answer to this ambiguous concept it's building up. Or the Zygon invasion, Zygon inversion, with the whole which Osgood argument throughout that two-parter which really should not have been ambiguous. I just appreciate that this episode sticks to its guns on being ambiguous. It's a very contentious episode, but I think that's just because audiences have gotten so used to everything being spoon-fed to them. And I appreciate this episode that, for lack of a better term, makes you think, you know? Like, I think the best way to sum this up is... Kate's speech to Ruby like what is it she says it's like when we don't have the answers we make up the rules ourselves, and that's essentially what Ruby's doing throughout this episode it's one of Mil it's one of Millie Gibson's strongest performances in this entire season and on her strengths alone this is a brilliant episode if you've been keeping track you know what's coming up number one 
my favorite episode of the season, The Devil's Chord. As soon as this episode finished, for me, I realized this was going to be the high of the season, and none of the other episodes have compared at all. This just falls into that type of camp that I really enjoy, and I'm going to be honest, a lot of this episode, Jinx Monsoon is carrying on their shoulders. Like, they are having a blast as the maestro, and their fun is infectious. But they are also playing it in a way that comes off as really menacing, really sinister. It's like, it's that element John Sim was lacking. He was so over the top and goofy that I just never found him menacing. But Jinx Monsoon, despite, again, how similarly crazy they're playing it up, they managed to come off as intimidating. So far for this era, we have had three Pantheon episodes. The Giggle, The Devil's Chord, and The Legend of Ruby Sunday, Empire of Death. By a country mile, The Devil's Chord is the best one. Shooty Gatwa and Millie Gibson are once again similarly great. You know, highlights include The Doctor's absolute terror in facing a being like the maestro and i am so glad russell t davies didn't do what he did during the tenant era and make the doctor god we also have ruby playing the piano that's a wonderfully well done scene with a great cameo from classic who costume designer june hudson and we have the entire silent scene where the doctor tries to take away all the sound so the maestro can't find them that's a really brilliant well done tense scene this episode is just really well structured and put together and basically like i said now that i'm comparing it again because i just said of the three pantheon episodes this episode really succeeds in a lot of ways where empire of death really failed because structurally they kind of play out in the same way and i do like even though the beatles even though, like, again, the promotional material said Doctor Who meets the Beatles and the Beatles ultimately didn't play a big role in this episode, I do like that it's them and just the simple act of music that defeats the maestro. It's, you know, like I, like I just said, I'm going to repeat myself like I tend to do. This episode is just the better done version of Empire of Death. And there you have it. My ranking for the episodes of Doctor Who Series 14 slash Season 1. What is yours? Share your ranking in the comments below. It's always nice to hear back from you. Be respectful to people who disagree with you. And remember to like, comment, subscribe. Click the bell next to subscribe to get notifications when I upload. Share the video around, please. All of it helps my channel grow. In the description box below, you'll find the link to my socials where you can follow me and get updates on the channel. This is Sir Jedi Sentinel, and in regards to the TV show, I'll see you guys next time for the 2024 Christmas special. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.